Welcome, Colin. Welcome Thanks. to Brisbane. Thank you very much, Russell, and uh, uh, Your Grace. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I feel very honoured to be here in this gathering of value-driven and committed professionals. And the sense that I've got, there's a real sense of community here, which is very important because I sense when I go around Australia, we're losing a bit of that sense of community. And so I'm, uh, and I'm humbled to be here as well. I didn't want to give a lecture. I didn't want to talk at people, but uh, I'd rather just uh, share some reflections and perceptions that I've had over, over 40 years from the law and uh, from being in St Vinnie's and uh, and other aspects of my life and hope that uh, that may give you something to take away and reflect upon. But thank you for having me here. Colin, can we start with your reflections on the case that brought us together, um, Titus Ani? Can you tell us a little bit about who Titus Ani is and how he came to be on death row? Well, I was introduced to Titus Ani through having acted for uh, Lee and Christine's son, Scott. And when I was acting for him to have uh, his death penalty uh, uh, reviewed and uh, hopefully, as it was, finally annulled, um, Scott shared a fourth world condition cell in the death tower at Kiribokan prison. All death uh, sentence prisoners are segregated and they are in their own death row facility. And in Kiribokan, it was a, a, a tower. And his name was Emmanuel because he was sentenced and convicted under the name of Emmanuel O. E. Hegerica of Sierra Leone. Anyway, uh, but his real identity is Titus Ani from Nigeria. He was sentenced not only on the wrong name, as the story came out, uh, wrong nationality, he was sentenced on the wrong facts because he had been uh, trafficked with a false passport and he was sentenced to death because he'd done it nine times. This was his first trip to Bali with drugs consumed inside in condoms, as dangerous a way you can uh, courier drugs. But this is after the syndicate had murdered his sister, Blessing, in Nigeria and trafficked him, coerced him, from his refugee camp in Nigeria, uh, in Pakistan, to Bali. He came out a number, many times and didn't ever tell his story. And it was Scott Rush who said to me, he said, I know you think I'm in real trouble, but wait till you listen to Emmanuel's story. And I listened to the story and he just quietly told it. And it was one of those prison discussions that you never, ever forget because you know that you're almost certainly acting for an innocent person. And yet here he was on death row and had been for a number of years sentenced to death. So I uh, asked him to write it, it down. And uh, one of the things you learn in, in death row cases is uh, uh, what Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist uh, uh, monk and writer, says uh, about deep listening. You really have to listen carefully and get it right. But you must then also project that you are there for her or his welfare. That was the beginning of what turned out to be a nine and 10 year epic that involved uh, wonderful professionals in this room from this gathering. I was so 
shaken, taken, I went back to the Criminal Lawyers Association of the Northern Territory and said, look, at a meeting, I said, these are the facts. Um, we've got to get raised some money. And uh, anyway, Lee and Christine, around that time, uh, came across to the, the visiting area while sitting on the floor outside the tower, if you call that a visiting area, with Father Tim Harris, uh, now Bishop Harris. And Father Tim was similarly moved as I was and then came back and uh, spoke at the Graceful Parish. Um, and that's how Roland Peterson became involved as a volunteer and uh, through Roland Russell. And it's been a pro bono exercise for the last uh, uh, yeah, 10 years. But what I can say is, as we gathered evidence from America, from Pakistan, from Nigeria, from Australia and from Thailand, everything that Titus humbly wrote down turned out to be accurate. His is a compelling, if I was in the Court of Criminal Appeal, I'd walk in confidently say, despite the judges, I'm even going to win this, you know. Um, and, uh, but uh, we, uh, the political atmosphere in Indonesia is um, close to toxic when it comes to drugs. Uh, and he's Nigerian and the perception in, uh, in Indonesia is that Nigerians are responsible for it all. Whereas they're only the pawns because they're so poor and they're the ones that get used. So thanks to Russell and his firm and Roland and, and Bobby and uh, others uh, and the criminal lawyers of the, of the Northern Territory, we've uh, put together and we had witnesses coming from America, from uh, Nigeria, from Thailand, uh, from Australia, experts, and we uh, have put a compelling forensic case together which finished in court last Thursday with the documentation all certified to go into the dossier, it's the uh, Dutch civil s system, and then it goes off to the Supreme Court for the judges on the Supreme Court to make a decision on the papers. And as Russell knows, and as Bob knows, as Roland knows, you come away from each hearing date, and the hearings in Indonesia are like the hearings in Holland and France. You have one day, then it's adjourned over to that day the next week or two weeks later. Um, you come away with a feeling of real flatness, wondering and you're second guessing all the time what you're, what you're doing. But I think, and our Indonesian lawyers who argued the case in court, wonderful lawyers whom I've known over many years, uh, we had a great collegiate uh, spirit amongst the team. Um, they put up with my rudeness of saying, no, no, that's not the way we're going to go, we're going to go this way. Um, and then politely steered me back if I needed to be. Um, it was an exercise of reaching out for one of our fellow, the least of our brethren. Titus was the most powerless person I've ever met in the, uh, in the, in the justice system anywhere. So it's a credit to you, Russell and Roland and the Criminal Lawyers Association of the Northern Territory and other uh, anonymous uh, uh, beneficiaries from uh, Brisbane Archdiocese who've allowed this case to be able to pay the Indonesian lawyers at their reduced rates for the case to happen. So that's, in a nutshell, um, Titus Ani. Titus, over the years, he's been 14 years on death row, and there are books written on what is called the death row phenomenon. And that is people who face and are under the 
sentence of death for such a long period of time start to mentally become unwell and I've seen Titus sadly over the last few years become progressively unwell to the point that he was so unwell that he wasn't even able to attend the proceedings on the last uh, few occasions. So uh, there it is. Uh, it's in God's hands now and the judges of the Supreme Court. Um, and I hope that the political atmosphere doesn't uh, influence things. But if you look around the world in the death penalty, the United States is the classic. The death penalty is always political. Colin, you mentioned um, the flatness that you feel at the end of a visit in prison and court. There were some highlights, though. Um, could you talk a little bit about Lord Professor Sahatapi and the advice that he gave the judges and then the reaction that the judges had to his evidence? Yes, there is a, uh, an emeritus professor of criminology who was famous in Indonesia. as a professor from uh, a Christian, uh, from, uh, and he gave evidence in court, and it was really a performance. Um, and, uh, and he, said, he's, he said, I'm 84, so I'm closer to the maker than you are, to, to the judges. So I don't, I'm not mucking around here. I'm telling you the truth. And this is the, the, the truth. And you could see that the judges were all sitting back. And uh, of course, one of them that came out later and was shaking hands, only in Indonesia, the judges come out and shake hands with a witness when they like. He couldn't, he, he couldn't do it in Australia. But he had been a student at university many years before of Professor Sahatapi. And he was one of the very generous Indonesian persons that came forward to give evidence on behalf of the powerless Titus Ani and to express at the age of 84, and he had to be assisted by his daughter to the stand uh, to be able to give evidence, but that didn't stop him. It's a little chair in front of the panel of judges from standing up and, and giving a, a defiant. Uh, uh, we met a lot of very good people along the way in that case, and of course in Scott Rush's case and other cases, um, who uh, quietly do good works under the radar I can see we've got a photo of the prosecutor here. He also was quite friendly to our side. Uh, that is an historic photograph, I can tell you. This is Weera, who's a very spiritual Balinese. But this photograph, I can tell you, is the only photograph I have ever had taken with a prosecutor in any case I have ever been <laughs> in my life. And there might be another photo coming up later with Lord Professor Sahatapi. He looks just like Yoda from Return of the Jedi, so you'll be able to pick him. My personal favourite was when he um, told the judges that when he sees his maker, that he'll be giving a personal report card on each of the judges, <laughs> and uh, unless they did the right thing. <laughs> so, Colin, um, there's a lot at stake in these cases. Uh, the execution process. Uh, you're close to Father Charlie Burroughs. Um, can you talk a little bit about what Father Charlie has told you about those final days? Yes, uh, from reading the regulations, and we're talking the regulations as to execution. These go back to the late 1800s of the Dutch colonial period, a legacy, a colonial legacy. Father Charlie Burroughs is one of those delightful Irish priests who was sent out with vows of station 37 years ago and was sent to the remote south central Java and at Chilichap, where he's worked as a parish priest and a communicator and, and active in a whole range of charitable work. But it's also the parish next to the island of Nusa Kambangan, which is the island where uh, over the last decade, death penalty prisoners are sent to be executed. 
And Father Charlie, simply by reason of being the parish priest uh, at Chillichap, became the priest that was called upon uh, to uh, deal and uh, administer to Catholic and some Christian persons who were facing and to be executed. The execution process uh, involves the first step when you're sentenced is you're isolated and you're put into a death row or a death tower. As the execution comes closer, maybe three or four months off, you are then transported to Noosa Kambangan and no one comes back from Noosa Kambangan. And you're then in the death row area and no one tells you what's happening until uh, five days before they say you can have your last visit from family and relatives. Two days before, all communication and visits are stopped except for the, uh, the priest or the monk or the imam to give you religious advice prior to your execution. Executions must take place in the quarter of an hour before midnight. But while this is all happening, the Brigade Mobile on Noosa Kambangan, uh, within hearing distance out in the execution field near the death row, are practicing shooting. So you, you can, the prisoners hear the, uh, the shots and the, and the uh, going off while uh, they're waiting for their execution. Father Charlie's visited so many of them and he was there in the Chan and Sukumaran uh, executions and for the Catholics and the Christians uh, he uh, has a system, they're tied to poles uh, and then they're given an option whether they want to have a blindfold or not. Ch Father Charlie or the Imam or, or the, the monk or the, uh, is allowed to be present, the only person present. And he has his uh, prisoners as a last human act and they sing that amazing hymn, Amazing Grace. And uh, he uh, speaks of the prisoners who by this stage have said no and they sing amazing grace until their bodies slip on the poles and they're dead. Father Charlie said, you know, I can't do his accent, even though he's been in Indonesia 37 years, he's still got that Irish accent. You know, it's torture. And it is. So that's what we're up against and we don't want to see Titus face in this case. And uh, Colin, in your interactions with Titus and Scott, um, you've seen both of them have to deal with um, a very serious situation. Scott was on death himself for a number of years and now is on life, which means life. What has helped um, Scott get through these really dark times? Well, family, of course, first and foremost. Uh, I've uh, seen Scott literally since when Bob Myers and I met that f f fateful first day when uh, they'd been arrested and we were dealing with respectful clients and I had Renee Lawrence at first. Uh, and then Renee got 20 years and that was fine. Um, Scott's had the support of family and it's been trauma for Lee and Christine to have their son um, uh, caught up and then facing the death penalty on a charge where if it was here, three years, you know, three years. Um, and uh, he... Uh, Scott has, you know, uh, it's 12 and a half years and I've seen him very regularly and it's up and down. 
because of fourth world prison conditions. Uh, when I, and I see Scott regularly, and I say, what are your cell conditions like? And it varies. Seven in a cell, and it was four last time. And it's a cell designed for three. No bed, no mattress, sleeping on the floor, basic meals, and, you know, nothing in the way of rehabilitation. So reading, family, and uh, his uh, uh, traditional uh, Catholic faith has helped steer him through to this stage. And I took a book to him some time back, Father Emmett Costello, SJ's book, My Brother Christ. And Scott reads that all the time. And on my last visit, and I'd waited and I waited and I told him that Father Costello had died. And he broke down. He was so upset. So, uh, and stimulation have got him into gardening and uh, trying to develop a garden. Um, there's no computer access there. Um, reading, um, and then visitors. It's a lonely place. Prisons are lonely places. And uh, he's had the support of his mum and dad, and it's cost Lee and Christine mightily, uh, financially and emotionally and in every sense. So what I really want to do is see how we can get Scott, Michael Chugar, his old classmate, and all the remaining members of the Bali Nine back to Australia. The suggestion is to the uh, Foreign Affairs Department that we try for a prisoner exchange program with Indonesia. And as we uh, negotiate this comprehensive free trade agreement, and as Indonesia emphasises trade and its foreign relations, then it's not beyond us to uh, put up some values. Namely, we don't want our citizens executed, thank you very much. And we expect uh, that there be some form of clemency prisoner exchange. Um, I'd like to see Scott, he's done 12 and a half years, what he would have got in Australia was three. And we can't help but uh, remember that uh, they all ended up where they were uh, as a result of the officer of the Australian Federal Police in Bali dobbing them in to the Indonesian police on that fateful night. So back on um, the question of faith, we've talked about how Scott's faith has greatly assisted him. Um, apart from our regular prayers to St Jude, uh, could you talk a little bit more about your unique faith? And it's, it's not really doctrinal, but um, tell us about how faith plays a part in your life. Well, I'll deal with St Jude first, because I remember in Form 4, uh, Brother William O'Malley saying, now, MacDonald, just forget it. You're so hopeless, just pray to St. Jude. He's the hope of the hopeless. <laughs> um, but I have to say, I've only ever prayed to St. Jude five times in my life, and each time it worked in very dire circumstances. Um, faith has, paid a, has played an important uh, role in my life. Uh, that's Titus. I'll just interrupt you. Titus is the um, gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, the, Prison, that's his prison officer, Rindra, and um, another prison officer. You find amazing people in strange places. Uh, Rindra was such a gentle, beautiful person who gave Titus um, so much dignity in, uh, in very difficult times. Sorry. Yeah, on. and Rindra, as a, a prison officer, would text you if there was something wrong. Um, the Indonesian prison system, yes, it's fourth world, but the prison officers in it, like so many of the good prison officers we have in Australia, and I've met so many of them, it's not funny, really 
uh, become involved and they, they know that this person is in a hopeless position and they try to help in their humble little way from their position of proximity. And uh, more a bit about your faith journey? Uh, my faith journey uh, is really inherited. Uh, I came as, a, my family, the McDonald's of Clan Ranald, came as refugees in 1852 on a boat. Uh, the clipper ship Marco Polo from the uh, sequelae of the Highland Clearances. We supported Bonnie Prince Charlie and we were Catholic. I'd be on Manus Island now, of course, but uh, um, uh, I don't know how the McDonald's would handle that. I think there'd be a bit of a breakout. Um, uh, and I inherited uh, Catholicism from my family. It was um, one of the things that held them together that kept them strong because they had nothing else. And the only thing that I can remember in my grandmother's home was a tapestry that was brought out on that boat. On that boat, the clipper ship Mar Marco Polo, the only belonging they had. And it was a tapestry that read, take care ye, the stranger. And uh, uh, yes, I was brought up a Catholic. I had a wonderful... Uh, education. Uh, I had inspiring brothers at St. Patrick's College, uh, Ballarat, who taught me and gave me a great love of poetry that's been with me for all my life. And uh, I had a, a record stint in the Christian Brothers novitiate for two weeks and uh, <laughs> came, came home much to the relief of my father and he said, the sheep in the back paddock need shifting. <laughs> But faith has been very important and as you get older, you look back and you have perceptions of things that you just do because it's part of custom, it's what the family does and what have you. But when you, when you reflect and you then become involved and listen and understand Buddhism and Hindu religion, you realise that it has so much to do with the fundamental core values of Christianity, the Beatitudes, love your neighbour as yourself. What you do unto to the least of my brethren, you do unto me. And uh, I uh, would rather live in a, a generous, caring, outreaching society than one that is selfish, um, doesn't have a, a respect for the mysterious and uh, the other noble features that lie in every one of us. So faith has been very important and in the end is one of the things that has kept me strong at times when it's, uh, as Lee and Christine know, it's a lonely road out there in Bali and, uh, um, and other places. So I'd like to uh, just say a, a, a few more words about Scott. Um, Scott's a remarkable person. He, uh, he has faith um, and faith is one of the things that's helped keep him strong. But the prison conditions and the time uh, and having hope and when you're on life and life is life, um, it's very difficult. But there are two opportunities. The Constitutional Court in Indonesia handed down a decision in September last year to say that people on death row and uh, life sentences could make a second judicial review. And that's something that we're going to explore, Lee. Um, and the other is uh, just politically and diplomatically in terms of the negotiation of the Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. Um, well, let's get the, our prisoners back on whatever terms and conditions, if they've got to do a few more years here, so be it. Um, and then give, uh, uh, come together and uh, try to get Scott another hearing because he has got new facts that could be relevant. And uh, I, I spoke about deep listening. And one of the things I like to try and do with Scott is not just to listen, but for him to have confidence that there's something just could happen 
and that's what I want to do. So Colin, um, I mentioned before that PwC have sponsored some young professionals who are here today. Uh, the title of this presentation has been The, Load, the Road Less Travelled. Um, can you, t one final question, and we've only got five minutes left, uh, is can you talk about when you were at that um, fork in the road and a particular conversation that may have changed you from being a banking solicitor uh, to the road that you've travelled? Yes, uh, the, uh, the title is taken from one of my favourite poems by Robert Frost and uh, it's the last stanza of The Road Not Taken. And it ends, two roads diverged in a wood and I. I took the one less travel by, and that made all the difference. I was a, a keen, energetic, hardworking, long hours, enthusiastic banking and international banking and Japanese trade law solicitor, and that was where I was heading. And, uh, but I've been, throughout my university years, uh, I did two nights a week at St Vincent de Paul's Osnum House, doing the normal volunteer work that you do with homeless men, and they were men in those days. We now see in Darwin we have women and kids coming. And, um, and I uh, shared it with a, a, a whole range of wonderful other volunteers and a charismatic priest, Father Phil Hoy. Anyway, in 1976, when I'm in the height of Father Hoy said, now, Colin, what you need is commitment. And I was sort of up to my eyeballs in, you know. And I said, what? He said, uh, the St Vincent de Paul Society's got a, a project uh, up there out of Darwin for the Catholic missions for uh, employment, uh, cr uh, creation and enhancement of Aboriginal communities and I want you to take part. And you give up your holiday and you do it. And I, what do you say? I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> I'd never been to Darwin before, I never, anyway. So I went up there on the holiday. This is the conversation that I what was to change my life. And I was there met by Brother Gallagher with his toweling hat and one arm. And he welcomed me and I went to Catholic missions and met some of the people that were later to be some of the most wonderful people I'd met, the accountant, the engineer who designed Aboriginal houses in consultation with Aboriginals for $12,000 and they're still there. God knows what's happened with the waste that goes on now. And then, uh, uh, and I wasn't a, a drinker and uh, they were all drinking VB. So I sort of took a VB and had a sip and pretended to be part of it, thinking, my God, it's hot here, you know? <laughs> um, and then Brother Gallagher said, right, it's time for you to go. we are going to get on the plane. And uh, plane? Uh, yes, you're going down to Port Keats. Right, and I thought that might be like Moorabbin Airport compared to <laughs> Essendon Airport in Melbourne. I thought, okay. One and a half hours later, over flying over jungle and rivers and what have I landed at the Catholic mission in, in Port Keats. And uh, I was there met by uh, the Murin Association boss that I was going to help assist. Um, that was an airline association and a whole group of Aboriginal uh, persons, and I'd never met a full-blood Aboriginal in my life. And I can still remember Justin Chinbra saying to me, you haven't come here to cause trouble, have you? And I, thought, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I was in culture shock uh, for the first week. And after that, I saw aspects of this society and the people, the nuns, the lay missionaries that were contributing, uh, making a difference in the lives of these people, and it affected me deeply. So, so deeply, I, I, um, I was taken out by an artist that hang in the Australian National Gallery and shown how to 
take bark off the tree and prepare it and I was introduced to art. That was where my love of art began. And uh, anyway, I came back and I was moved and I did it the next year and the same experience, um, wider experiencing the gar you know the, gar the, the gardeners that had 26 employed Aboriginals with them, the, the missionary, lay missionary, $60 a month was the salary plus keep, who had nine apprentices learning how to become an electrician. The plumber had 12. And uh, so anyway, I got back and the banking practice was going well and we'd acquired another bank and what have you. And the partners offered me an associate partnership. And that was one of the most sleepless nights of my life. And I went back the next day and I said to the partner that I dealt with, um, no, I, I can't do it. I, I, I'm going to resign. And anyway, the partners went away and it came back and they're all laughing and said, it's all right, we got you. We're going to pay you more money. <laughs> uh, on that note, Colin, um, on that good note, <laughs> Mary warned me that this would happen, that I'd get through six of my 300 questions uh, for you. Colin, thanks for um, joining us today. Could we please thank uh, Colin McDonald? <laughs>